following program is recorded content created by the Truth Network. It's Matt Slick Live. Matt is the founder and president of the Christian Apologetics Research Ministry, found online at CARM.org. When you have questions about Bible doctrines, turn to Matt Slick Live for answers. Taking your calls and responding to your questions at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. It's me, Matt Slick. And coincidentally, you're listening to Matt Slick Live. And uh, for those of you who might be newbies by any chance, Slick is my real last name. How about that? And it works great for radio. And uh, just like my friends say, hey, everything works out for you for radio because you got a face for radio and a voice for radio. See, hey, thank you. So anyway, we have two open lines if you want to give me a call, 877-207-2276. I want to hear from you. All right, we man, we got calls coming in already. Let's just jump on the phone. Let's get to Kelly from South Carolina. Kelly, welcome. You're on the air. Thank you. Um, so my question for you is, do you believe that there's any evidence in the Bible that Adam and Eve repented? And also, do you think that we should read the Apocrypha about that sort of thing if it's not inspired by the Holy Spirit? Okay. Good. So, did they repent? Uh, we would assume that they did. And the reason we would assume is because you really can't be saved without uh, repentance. Not that repentance brings you salvation, but it's it's concomitant with the issue of regeneration and God's saving work upon us. Now, Adam and Eve were covered uh, with animal skins. The implication there is... Um, that they were, that was a pre-incarnate Christ who did this, covered them with animal skins, the blood being shed, hence they were covered. And so we can just generically kind of say, well, it does seem like they repent. Uh, they hid themselves. They knew they did wrong. And then, um, you know, they accepted the uh, the covering of, of God for them. So I'm sure they, I, I would say most probably, yeah, of course they would have repented. Okay, I forgot your other question was. Okay. What was your other question, though? No. And as I was re- as I was researching that on your website, I came across the books of Adam and Eve, and it says translation from the Apocrypha, and it talks about them being repentant and what they did. And would you think that we should be reading and taking those verses to heart, or do you think we should avoid the Apocrypha? Depends. See, I'll read the Apocrypha in order to see what it says so I can debate about it, teach about it. I'll read the Quran for the same reason, or the Book of Mormon for the same reason. Not that they're inspired, but because we had to be informed. So if that's your issue, then fine. You don't read them if you think they're in, uh, inspired. They are not inspired. They're not on the same level as Scripture. So I don't have any problem with people reading apocryphal material if they realize this is just apocryphal material. Don't assume it's automatically correct, because the apocryphal documents have uh, problems in them, and there's historical problems, doctrinal problems, and some very serious issues. And the, and, uh, the church and the Jews never uh, considered them to be inspired. So we do have, however, for example, that the book of Enoch is quoted in the book of uh, Job and uh, Jude. It doesn't mean the book of Enoch is, is uh, inspired. It means... That when Jude, who was inspired, quoted it, the quote was inspired, not that the uh, the whole book of Enoch is inspired. And there's like over 20 books in the uh, Old Testament and the New Testament that are referenced that are not inspired. The Book of the Wars, for example, is one, and it's, it's, it was a book that the Jews had, and so one of the writers, I forgot which, uh, looked at it and then quoted it. Okay, this is it. And so it's accurate. So it's not inspired, but when it's quoted, the quote and included in the inspired documents then becomes inerrant because it's accurate historically. Okay? Mm-hmm. That makes Wonderful. sense. Wonderful. Well, I appreciate you helping me think that through. Yes, sir. And thank you for all the fantastic information on your website. It's a wonderful resource. Well, praise God. You know, I just give thanks to God who can use a uh, an, an ex-occultist slime dog with um, Asperger's to be able to produce something that is useful to people, but that's only by His grace. So praise God. Thank you. Wow. Well, praise the Lord. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome so much. Well, God bless, Kelly. Hope you have a good weekend. God bless you. Okay. You too. Right. Bye-bye. All right, now let's get to, I think it's, I'm not sure, I, get the, I can't see the whole letters, Bojo from Louisiana. Welcome, you're on the air. Yes, it is 
me in Louisiana, and uh, I don't want to talk about flying saucers or politics, if that's okay. okay whatever you want to talk <laughs> I, about, it's okay. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, well, your your programs the last couple of days I have been, you know, listening to. I just didn't call in, mm-hmm. but that's I right. had questions. I had questions. I questioned before was the word Christ and Messiah. I believe I believe you told me that those were relatively the same words, but in two different right. languages. Was that right? Right, Messiah. It comes from the Hebrew Mashiach, and uh, it's translated into the Greek uh, Christos. That's all, Christ. And Mas- and Messiah comes from where? The well, word it's Messiah. In the Old Testament. Yeah, it's just an Old Testament word, and uh, Mashiach. So I'm looking to see if I can find a reference um, that actually has it. Let me see if I can just do a search. Messiah. Yeah, yeah find, find me one in the Old Testament where it's... Yeah, if you can. it's uh, Daniel 9.25, uh, so that you are to know and discern that from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, the prince, there'll be seven weeks and 62 weeks. And incidentally... Uh, the decree to rebuild Jerusalem happened on March 14th, 445 B.C. And from that decree, it, the number of weeks that are designated, seven weeks and 62 weeks, that's when uh, he'll, he'll come in. That's 173,880 days, and that's when Jesus came in on a donkey into Jerusalem. That's just trivia. So there's one of the terms of Messiah in Daniel 9.25 and 9.26, and after 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off. And uh, there's another one in Matthew one one. Okay, interesting. And it, and uh, well, it's interesting. Let's see. Let's take a look at this. So you you look at in Matthew. Yes, Matthew one one. Okay, that's right. Oh yeah, there it is. And so that's interesting because in the NASB, I didn't notice this before. The NASB uh, translates the Greek word Christos into uh, the English Messiah. So when I look in other Bibles, um, it says, the ESV says, Christ, Jesus Christ, and King James Christ. Looking for any others. Only the NASB, interesting, does it as Messiah. And I believe the reason uh, he does this is because it's referring to the Old Testament. Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And so since Matthew is heavily Jewish, that's, he's a Jew, that would make sense why they would put that term into uh, into the uh, the Hebrew equivalent, Messiah. Interesting. Yeah, it's, okay. what's interesting is is I started reading uh, the Bible 40 years ago, and, and I Did started you reading it. Oh yeah, I finished it. Okay, I, just checking. I pretty well, I pretty well finished it and uh, re. I done. I mean, once you get on to Bible, I, you don't ever get finished, Matt. But you, <laughs> you, you got continually, that right. you continue. Well, it's just like right back. now. I I just learned something new, you know, and uh, I'm always learning. And so, you are right. You can't just uh, well, hey, I read the Bible once. I'm done. It doesn't work like that. That, right. how, you can't even read it twenty five times, and I don't think, and you know, say how I'm about twenty seven? Uh, With twenty seven, no, probably work? not either. No, I don't. Probably not. Okay. What do you All think? Right. What do you think? What? Well, maybe twenty seven to the twenty seventh power might be, say, give us a beginning to fathom its depths. But I think we're going to need. Yeah, to if, that. if seven times seventy place. take, yeah, if seven times seventy it takes, you know, to, what for forgiven. Right. You're probably right, but in in Acts, <laughs> Jesus talks about in Acts chapter one that they ask him specifically about the restoring of the kingdom to Israel, and that's where Jesus tells them that it's it's not fixed. It, in, in no other words or less, he said it's not fixing to happen right now, but you will receive the promise that you have heard from me that the Father has given to wait in Jerusalem for right. the Spirit to be poured out, right? Mm-hmm. That's right. So, mm-hmm. and and I believe when Jesus returns, 
according to the men in white, said he's going to, you know, come back down on that same mountain. And when he, at least I, is that is that the way you see it, that Jesus will return he's gonna, to that same mountain? Yeah, he's going to touch his, uh, his foot down on the Mount of Olives as the prophecy goes. It'll be an earthquake. And uh, he's returning in the in the clouds the same way he extend, ascended into heaven, uh, according to Acts one nine through eleven. It will not be in the uh, it was not in the uh, armies of Jerusalem, as uh, the preterists say. But anyway, that's another topic. So, oh, all right. Yeah, so Messiah is. and Christ right. is just Hebrew and Greek equivalents. Mashiach and Christos. And, Messiah and Christ. And, okay. But we're we're settled that those that are anointed by God do receive revelation from God. Is that correct? No, I wouldn't say that. Uh, if they're anointed really? from God, you know, look, look, for example, I, I, and I'm going to be very careful how I say this. I don't want to boast, hey, I'm anointed. But I believe that I have some sort of anointing that's from the Lord uh, because of what I do. And I say that with, with humility. I don't say it in a boasting way. I don't deserve anything. But I remember very clearly uh, something happening when all of a sudden I changed and I had an insatiable desire to study and it was from the Lord and this insatiable desire to study went on for several years and where I would read the Bible uh, four to six hours a day I'd go to Bible studies six nights a week and I could not stop studying I remember being at a job where I was a mechanical draftsman and I had a commentary of the Bible open, and I would read a paragraph and then continue to work while I'm thinking the paragraph while I'm doing my mechanics uh, drawing, and could not stop. And then I have the mind for, for logic and being able to remember patterns because I'm autistic. And so I believe that this is all God's work, and in that generic sense, it's an anointing, it's a calling, it's a, it's a, a commissioning for that kind of a thing. And I believe people, different people have that. I don't get revelation knowledge. I don't know things. Uh, I, I look at what the Bible says, and God illumines it to me, and that's it. So I hope that I'm correct when I, I believe I, I read stuff, and I'm sure I'm not in many areas. I just don't know what they are yet. So anyway, none so of, not anyone who's, none of us, no. none of us know, <laughs> none of us know what they are. The things that we don't know, but. The question, I, I guess, let me ask this question today. Are there apostles today? No, not in the New Testament sense, because in 1 Corinthians 9, 1, Paul says, Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen the risen Lord? Now, there are seven kinds of apostles in the New in the Bible, and um, Jesus is even called an apostle. But there's a Barnabas who is an apostle, but he didn't do any miracles or write scripture. And then there's apostello, means to send. So you can have an apostle who's sent. There's false, false apostles. And then there's the apostles who were the 12. So um, are there apostles today? We'd be very careful how we answer that question. Like Paul, uh, Peter? No, absolutely not. In the New Apostolic Reformation, where they say there's apostles today, they tend to have authority and be able to declare what God says and wants to be true and all this stuff. That's a load of, of crud. All right? Yeah. It doesn't happen like that. Okay. Are there are right, there buddy? prophets? Yeah, yeah. Are there? Yeah. Same thing. Are there Same prophets? Thing. Well, in the New Testament sense, out of First Corinthians fourteen, if they utter prophecy, it can be generically said they're prophets, but not in the Old Testament sense. That's an office. It was done. Luke sixteen sixteen, and there you go. We got to go, buddy. There's a break. Yes. Hey, thanks for calling. Hey, folks. We'll be right back after these messages. One open line. Give me a call. We'll be right back. It's Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. Okay, everyone, welcome back to the show. Let's get on the air with Rudolph from Raleigh, North Carolina. Rudolph, welcome. You're on the air. Yes, sir. Um, is emotional adultery grounds for divorce? Well, it depends what emotional adultery is and if that's even possible. I have to define it. Okay, can you define it? Well, uh, uh, I don't I guess it's emotional. Um, if you were cheating on your wife with your feelings 
with someone else maybe that's Okay, so how about this situation then? Um, a man uh, is emotionally drawn to another woman besides his wife, and it starts to fantasize about another woman uh, as being a better match for himself than his present wife, etc., etc., this kind of a thing. It starts thinking other areas that he shouldn't be thinking. That is, That would be a form of emotional and intellectual... Um, uh, adultery in that sense, but it's not actual adultery. And in such a case, such a man or woman, such a man would need um, counseling. And the elders of the church should be involved. And he, as a Christian, uh, should recognize uh, his uh, situation and come to repentance. And it's always doable and it's always workable. I know that it is because I've counseled people, marriage counseling, who've had that exact issue. And we've solved it. And it's all doable. Okay, so. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. God bless you, and have a good weekend. Bye. You too, man. God bless, Rudolph. All right. Watch out for those reindeer. All right. Two open lines. If you want to give me a call, 877-207-2276. Let's get to Dave from Kansas City. Dave, welcome. You're on the air. Thank you, man. Thank you, man. Um, sure. My pastor at our church here... Um, admonish the people to us in our congregation to read through James every day for 30 days. And I thought that was awesome. And I, yeah. I read through it for two weeks in different versions, because I have 50 different versions that I've read through. And I read through the King James, and it kind of got to James 4, 5, and it stuck out different than it did in other versions. And then I went to my study Bible. And I realized that MacArthur and Ryrie and everybody have different opinions on James 4 or 5, whether it's the Spirit, uh, James 4 or 5 said, the Spirit that envies, whether it's the Holy Spirit that envies for, you know, God is a jealous God, you know, uh, envies for our sanctification, right. or the human spirit that env envies after the things of the world. And there's various right. opinions on this. Mm -hmm. That's the top one. This is one of the reasons I suggest, another reason I suggest, that people not use the King James uh, for serious study. Uh, but on okay. the other hand, uh -huh. but on the other hand, you know, something like this could cause you to do a serious study when you go, what? And that, so, you know, it can work either way. The sword can cut both ways. All right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the spirit, uh, do you think, this is the King James, do ye think that the scripture saith, in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy. We see we don't talk like that. That's why <laughs> yeah, I don't use it. We don't talk like that. But that's okay. And so uh, when I look at this, that the spirit uh, dwelleth, dwelleth to causes to dwell by location. Uh, see katukis and katukidzo, and. Uh, in us, uh, wow, okay, ep, 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 thing. let's see, and that word contracted to yearn, desire earnestly, uh, that the spirit who dwells in us uh, earnestly desires, um, uh, and then thron, uh, uh, this is hard to pronounce, it's a, it's a P-H-T-H sound, P-H-T-H-O-N-O-N, -h -h -n -o -n in Greek, thanos, and so uh, so uh, that's jealousy, uh, righteousness, uh, envy, jealousy, pain felt, and malignity conceived at the sight of excellency or happiness. Interesting. So I'm just looking at lexicon definitions. So uh, the spirit dwelleth in us is lusting to envy. The word envy is the problem. Uh, well, lusteth, <laughs> both of them really are. Because, uh, yeah, it is all a problem. <laughs> Because, uh, yeah, well, you know, the King James, you know, it was done in 1611. That's 1611 language and context. I and then there was a later trans uh, update of it. And it still is uh, anachronous. Anachronous means mm -hmm. out of time and that it's a misplaced time. Like you look at a, a movie of Alexander the Great and one of the actors is wearing a wristwatch. That wristwatch would be anachronous mm -hmm. from Kronos time. Yeah. So... Uh, it's an it's a bit of an anachronistic uh, definition and so or meaning of the word, 
that's why I would just go mm-hmm. to uh, more modern translations, which I think uh, nail it mm-hmm. uh, perfectly. NASB says uh, he jealously desires a spirit to dwell in us. Uh, and ESV, he yearns jealousy over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. Uh, the spirit dwelleth, uh, that's King James. Uh, let's see. The new King James says mm-hmm. the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously. Uh, mm-hmm. The RSV. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, it is. It is. Well, it's uh, interesting because, in the MacArthur Study Bible, mm-hmm. MacArthur Study Bible, he uses the New King James and he has the Spirit, which is in capital S, okay? But MacArthur's notes say that that's the dead human spirit that left us after the world. Let's see. Mm. He jealously desires the Spirit, and this in the NESB is capitalized the spirit which he has made to dwell in us uh, that's what the, the uh, New American Standard says and so the ESV he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to which dwell in us and uh, which is not capitalized the ESV right and then mm-hmm. let's see RSV over the spirit mm-hmm. which he has made to dwell in us I can see why uh, the human spirit is what they're, they're getting at. And uh, mm-hmm. the spirit which he caused to dwell in us. So it, it's, this is, you're right, it is a very interesting uh, verse. The spirit yeah, that he caused to dwell in us, it could be that the Holy Spirit is caused to dwell in us, but it could also be that the human spirit is caused to dwell in us. Exactly. And, uh, mm-hmm. Right. The spirit which he has made, I like the NASB because I, I'm partial to it, and uh, yeah, let's see, by the temple of the Holy Spirit, uh, in First Corinthians six nineteen, Second Corinthians six sixteen, the temple of idols, temple of God, uh, I will dwell in them. Okay, so vital. Okay, He jealously desires the Spirit which He has made to dwell in us. To dwell is the infinitive, mm-hmm. and this is aorist active indicative. It's not the infinitive. So, Harris, that he has made to dwell. Wow, that's a toughie. You know what? I'm not sure to do it. Yeah, it's. Uh, I know that's that's the great thing. That's what I'm excited about because my friend and I were. He was talking that the, the Byzantine text is what what makes it the Holy Spirit, but the older text makes it in context a uh, a human spirit. So he was my friend that okay. knows the, the Greek much better than I do. Uh, said that so but I, we're we're really wrestling with that so I thought I'd get your opinion and we'll just wrestle with it and see so you, that's, you that's the exciting thing about learning script. you wrestle and call me back and tell me what you found okay we'll see who wrestles what in the submission <laughs> okay buddy we gotta go all right that's a very interesting verse all right may the Lord bless you okay hey we'll be right back after these messages please stay tuned Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. I'm glad you're listening. Let's get uh, on the line. Boy, I've been waiting a long time. Antoinette from Charlotte. What a nice name. So are you there? Hello. I did hit the right button. I'm here. Okay, there you go. All I'm right. here. Okay. okay. My question is, what about all the Halloween celebrating in the churches? Well, uh, what uh, what churches generally do, I've seen around here in Idaho, is do trunk or treat. And a bunch of cars will get into yep. a parking lot of a church and do that kind of thing, open the trunks, and the kids go do that. Uh, I just said to my wife a couple of nights ago, I am so looking forward to uh, Halloween because I just love the, the cute little kids in their outfits. And it's a, a delight. Um, so I have no problem with that. Now, it's from the day, Hallows, All Saints Day or All Hallows Day, which the next day, of course, is November 1st. And it was a celebration in paganism. Now, the thing is, are we allowed to celebrate the same day and even in the same kind of a thing that they did? Because people would put on masks, they would do different things, and it was ultimately in order to trick demonic forces so they wouldn't recognize who they were. 
and that they would go door to door or they would travel and so it evolved into what we call Halloween oh okay I'm sorry we can't do that now why because that's what they did hundreds of years ago so we're guilty if we do the same thing no we're not Christians don't believe it's a demonic force behind a mask when a little uh, four-year-old pony girl walks up and you know and she's got a cute little outfit she's got a little bag or something up it, it, it's just cute so we're free to celebrate it but we're not free to do that if it's going to stumble others we can't use our freedom as a reason for uh, for stumbling anybody else but we're free and I don't have any problem with people uh, personally uh, celebrating Halloween and having fun and, and Christmas gifts and Thanksgiving and celebrating a birthday it's not idolatrous and we're not worshiping anything pagan just because of pagan origin doesn't mean it's pagan now just like the Arabs invented the zero the Arabs are pagans well we can't use the word the zero now can we or Saturday comes from Saturn you know the, the Saturn the god Saturnalia mm -hmm. or well not Saturnalia but this, uh, Saturn was a god well we can't celebrate and use the word Saturday now you see how this gets ridiculous so we just have to be careful be wise go have fun uh, just don't celebrate anything demonic and just go have fun you know it's fun okay okay thank you very you much Okay, hope that helps. But boy, I am so looking forward to the little, little kids at the door. That's just awesome. Okay. All right, anything else? Okay, I guess not. All right, let's get on the air with Ryan from Pennsylvania. Ryan, you've been waiting a long, waiting a long time. Sorry about that. What do you got, man? Um, uh, thank you for inviting me to call back. And um, I have a question about two passages. Um, one is Romans 5. 15 through 21, but the free gift is not like the offense, for if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God in the gift of the, by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to many. And the gift is not like that which came through one who sinned, for the judgment which came one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came uh, from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned through one, much more will those receive abundance of grace, and the gift of righteousness will ring in life through the one Jesus Christ. Uh, therefore, uh, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as the one man's disobedience, uh, many were made sinners, so also one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. And this is the, um, the, the verse I want to center in on. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in, uh, in death, so even so, grace might reign through righteousness, to, through eternal life uh, in Jesus Christ our Lord. Then the second passage is Hebrews 5, 1 and 2. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men and things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. In verse 2 who can have compassion upon the ignorant, and them that are out of the way. For the Before that, he himself also was compassed with infirmity. And uh, I listened to you yesterday make the conjecture. You said, if uh, babies who die in infancy uh, go to hell, then they deserve it. It seems to me that when, uh, when Romans 5.20 says, where sin has abounded, grace has abounded even more, and when it says that he will have compassion upon the ignorant, and them that are out of the way. We can certainly say that the compassion of Christ, the grace of Christ, and uh, will be extended to infants who die in infancy, and certainly they would be redeemed. And that, um, that to conjecture uh, that they would be sent to hell because they deserve it is really, really um, against the idea that God <laughs> is a God of love. Well, no, it's not. But I didn't say that. I said, if... They go to hell. It's because they deserve it. I didn't say they I did. Said, I said you conjectured it. I said you conjectured it. Okay. So if they do, if it's if it's the case that they do, is it not also true that if they did, it's because it was proper and right upon them, if that's the case, right? No, it's, it's a of, violation of uh, grace no, abounding not. more than sin. Yes, no, no, no. It's, you know what the difference between a sound and valid argument is? An argument has to be valid and yes, also I do. sound. Yes, I do. Okay. So we're talking about syllogistic uh, pr premises here. So if it's the case that, premise one, if it's the case that all people are sinners, 
because and we know from and you quoted it in Romans five nineteen by the offense of the one the many were made sinners. The many were made is the aorist passive indicative, and it means that everybody in Adam, First Corinthians fifteen twenty two, in Adam all die. He's the federal head. So therefore, all people are made sinners by Adam's sin. Pe uh, babies are people. Therefore, babies are sinners. It's uh, it's valid. And it's sound because it's biblically based. So based on this, if I say that any babies go to hell, it's because they deserve it because they're sinners. I didn't say that they all do. In fact, I did say to the guy, I believe the babies, when they die, they go to heaven. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, how is that a um, an expression of uh, grace abounding more than sin? And how is that of um, a an expression of compassion upon the ignorant and them that are out of the way? Well, you got to be careful here because we talk about in Hebrews chapter five is about a high priest, and Jesus, who's the high priest after the order of Melchizedek, which is why he's baptized. Another topic, yeah. and so he's able to offer the gifts and sacrifices for sins. He's the one who did this and deal gently with the ignorant and misguided. He's talking about people who are aware, not like the infants, ignorant and misguided. Well, certainly. Because hold on, the, uh, hold on a sec, hold on a sec, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. The ignorant and misguided falls under the Granville Sharp rule. It's where a definite article appears and is separated by the the conjunction chi, where two uh, adjectives are there. So this dealing with the same individual or group, dealing with the ignorant, not the ignorant people and other misguided people, but the people who are both ignorant and misguided. The Granville Sharp rule applies here. So that's what he's talking about here. He's not talking about the infants. Well, my my point is is that uh, certainly uh, there are uh, mentally um, um, people that are mentally unable to understand the gospel. Certainly, there are people that are um, mentally ill that we could say that are out of the way. Um, sure. And, um, mm -hmm. he, he's going to have compassion upon those people. Of course, and he certainly is. Certainly, we could say that um, uh, that and, and again. It's saying that grace abounds more than sin, and that uh, certainly uh, that is an expression of God's grace, and certainly an expression of God's compassion. And of course uh, it is. so, uh, you know, and so um, the idea that uh, because they were born in original sin, um, it seems to me we can say, well, grace will abound more than original sin, and compassion will be upon those that no, are no, 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 certainly no. infants or ignorant. No. Why not? You make a category error. So you'd say one abounds more than the other, different categories of abounding and uh, abounding of God's grace, and then more than it designates uh, an equivalent. It's an is, not almost an is of identity here, uh, where one thing's related directly to another, but that's not really the case. So you're, you're doing making that mistake. So it's an issue of logic. I'm sorry, but it is. So look, the Bible teaches that all people who go to hell do so because they deserve it. They're under sin. If anybody goes to hell that's that's why if any infants go if that's why now do they that's well, another issue then we get to see if the the syllogisms well, the, will be sound the second premise well correct me if i'm wrong according to your theology you believe that god predestined the elect from the foundation of the world to go to heaven and all the rest will be condemned correct yes okay if that is indeed the case then everything you're doing as a Christian apologist, everything every preacher is doing, everything every missionary is doing, is meaningless and valueless because it has no bearing on who goes to heaven oh, and who goes oh. to hell. So then you're saying then meaning is only derived on whether or not someone goes to heaven or not. Not if it's centered in God's glory I'm saying that and meaning, His purpose and decrees. I'm, you made another mistake. You don't know what the universal uh, aspect of God's glory and meaning is based on Him. We've got a break. Talk to you later, buddy. Hey folks, three open lines, 877-207-2276. Ryan keeps calling and making logic errors. We'll be right back. It's Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. Okay, everyone, welcome back to the show. Let's see, let's get on with Elijah from Pennsylvania. Elijah, welcome. You're on the air. Hey, man, how you doing? Doing all right. Hanging in there, man. What do you got? Yeah, uh, my question is uh, uh, concerning Judas Iscariot in Matthew chapter 10. Um, your your position is that uh, Judas Iscariot was 
never received to begin with. Am I correct? Yes. Okay, so my question is, um, if if Judas Iscariot was never saved to begin with, then why in Matthew chapter 10 did uh, Jesus uh, give him uh, uh, charismatic gifts of casting out demons, killing the sick, raising the dead, along with the other uh, apostles who, who were saved? It doesn't say he gave him charismatic gifts. The Greek word is charisma. It's not there. It just says he gave them the authority to do that. Uh, it told us he gave them the authority over the unclean spirits. And the, the word authority is exousia. So he gave them that authoritative legal right over the demonic forces and to be able to heal. And there's nothing in Scripture that says you have to be a Christian in order for that to occur, because obviously right there, Jesus knew from the beginning who it was who would betray him and who's the devil from the beginning, as it says in John 6. So there you go. So uh, God can, so 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 God can give unbelievers powers to cast out demons and heal sick, heal sick. Okay, so you asked a question, and the Bible says, uh, "Let me go to this John six sixty four. Jesus says, "There are some of you who do not believe." For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe, and who it was that would betray him. Obviously, Judas did not believe Jesus was really who he said he was. So he knew who'd betray him and who, who it was who did not believe. Now, the implication is they're one and the same. Je Jesus knew that. In Matthew 10, 1, he summoned his 12 disciples, whom he called specifically. He knew Judas would do what he was doing, and he called him. Judas could not have done what he had done if Jesus had not called him to, to uh, be a disciple because he had to be a disciple in order to betray him to know where he was and have pr private information and knowledge of him. And Jesus gave him the ability to cast out demonic forces. It does not say he had to be saved for that. Okay? Okay. Uh, All right. And uh, my, my second question would be out of First uh, John uh, 4, 2, and 3. Um... Uh, have you uh, have you uh, heard that uh, uh, the, the Epistle of First John was written to uh, combat uh, Gnosticism that was uh, creeping yes. into the church? Yes, and part of the evidence okay. of that is in First John one as uh, the issue of sin, and that's why John opens it up with "We have seen and touched and felt," because in Gnosticism, in that context, uh, the spiritual purity could not inhabit materiality, and this is why he goes into First John for one. And he says, test the spirits. And he says, this is how you know that Jesus has come in the flesh. That's what he's talking about. Okay? Yeah. And uh, my, my question is uh, in verse 3. Now, in the King James, the New King James, and in the Aramaic Bible in plain English, in verse 3, they all say, and in, in the, in, in the, uh, the one who uh, does not uh, confess, that Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God, but all the other translations, translations omit has come in the flesh. And I think you know, you know, you know that kind of bothers me because because that because because the point the, the point of in verse three of, of him saying every spirit that does not confess Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God. You know, he's trying to point out point out the uh, error of this antichrist uh, Gnosticism, but uh, you know, all the modern translations. Uh, omit that. Uh, 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 does that wait a second. bother you as wait a second. well? Wait, wait, wait. I'm not sure I'm following you. Are you referring to verse three? It omits in the yeah, flesh, ver yeah, or verse yeah, two? Verse yeah, because it's verse in verse three. two. Okay, because it's in verse two that Jesus has come in the flesh, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. So, uh, I'm not an expert on on, on uh, Greek manuscript trees, uh, the issue of historicity, but I don't see any problem here at all. Okay. Because, because because uh the, uh the reason why I bring it up is because you know in like King James New King James uh in, in verse three it's following the the same train of thought as verse two but like you know the, mm -hmm. the following verse in in mm -hmm. the other translations omit that and it, and it, and, it, and it's making it seem like uh, you know uh, anybody who just doesn't ah. simply okay con confess gotcha. Jesus. 
yeah. generally speaking, generally speaking, the rule is the older the manuscript, the more reliable it is, the more accurate. The King James was translated with roughly sixth century documents, fifth and sixth century documents, and since then, older documents have been found. And uh, so, for example, the uh, NASB is translated with I forget which which um, tree, but it's older. And so the ESV does not contain the words uh, in the flesh. The King James uh, does, and the RSV uh, does not. The LEB does not. The NIV it does not. So it and this is just a cursory examination. But generally speaking, I've found that when there's a discrepancy, generally the King James is the one that's not correct because it's got later manuscript attestation instead of earlier, and the earlier is more accurate, and that would be the issue, generally speaking. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, cause, uh, I'm on Bible Hub, and, and, and the only the only translations that I see that uh, have it have verse 3 in that way is the King James, the New King James, and the Aramaic uh, Bible in in plain English. Uh, I'm not I'm not sure how accurate yeah. the Aramaic Bible is. Yeah, don't I wouldn't English I wouldn't I wouldn't go to the Aramaic Bible. I mean, you know, to see what they said and, and when. Uh, looking at the Greek, um, I don't have my textual apparatus with me here, where I could look up a, uh, a variation and to see if it, what text, what manuscript trees have what variant in it. But there's obviously a variant issue here. But uh, because what I've seen is a consensus that the more modern translations omit the phrase uh, in the flesh. It's because it's not there in the more reliable and more uh, and the earlier manuscripts, and it looks like it was an addition uh, to by the King James. Unfortunately, what then happens is people will say, "Well, the King James is true automatically, and all the other ones are Antichrist because they removed it from the flesh, so they're Gnostic," and it's very faulty reasoning. It's very fallacious uh, yeah. argumentation. Okay. Yeah. All right. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't know that the uh, that the uh, King King James manuscript date back to, to only the sixth century. I didn't. I didn't know that. Yeah, I've, I've uh, back in the day when I studied it, it was fifth and sixth century documents is what they what they had because we're talking sixteen eleven. Since then, they have found a lot more manuscripts. They just have, and they're still finding them. So I remember forty years ago. To the best of my recollection, I think it was like 53 or 5,400 manuscripts. And then in, in the past few years, I've been reading commentaries and they say 6,000 manuscripts. So, you know, they're, they're still finding stuff. And, uh, you know, so if they find, say, a manuscript that they can date to, say, the year 140, and it has uh, in here, uh, in the flesh, I'd be like, whoa, that's really important. Then you got to study what tree when I mean tree, not as a plant, but what manuscript tree or lineage uh, it was, where and why, and then how it would fit into the manuscript evidence. It's actually an interesting topic once you get into it, see how they, these guys do this stuff. They're very serious about it. But anyway, that, that's what I would say so far. Okay? Yep. All right, buddy. All right, Hope man. that helps. Thanks. Thanks Have a good one. All right. You too. God bless. All right. Let's get to Matt from... Uh, the People's Republic of California. Hey, Matt, welcome. You're on the air. Hey, how you doing? Doing all right. Hanging in there, man. What do you got? So I'm uh, I'm calling. In, uh, I'm a return caller. Yesterday, uh, okay. I was uh, talking um, okay. with regards to well, um, uh, yeah, it was a uh, part of it was uh, involving babies possibly being in hell okay. eternally. But uh, uh, I have a question. You you brought up yesterday about where you said Jesus was asked why he spoke in parables, and yeah. you said that he it says that he did that so that the, I guess the Jewish the teachers of the law uh, would not understand and they their sins would not be forgiven and they would not like. I said, here, let me read it, what Jesus but, says. To you has been given okay. the mystery of the kingdom of God, but those who are outside of the kingdom of God get everything in parables, so that while seeing they may see and not perceive, while hearing they may hear and not understand, otherwise they might return and be forgiven. So he's speaking in parables, so they won't be forgiven. Okay. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. So it, it doesn't say anything about salvation. I mean, it, it may be that 
they're, he doesn't want them to be seeking forgiveness at that time. And maybe, you know, there's, there's always time frames. It seems like biblically, you know, like there's seasons. Well, I think that that's worth a consideration. You know, is it mean only for that time? And, you know, I think mm-hmm. yeah, it's worth looking at and seeing. It, does it fit the context? Um, because a lot of times people have this idea that Jesus is the blonde haired, blue eyed Caucasian surfer dude dressed in a woman's nightgown. And that he, he wouldn't ever <laughs> <laughs> And that uh, he wouldn't speak in such a way like this. It has to be something else. And so what they've mm-hmm. done, a lot of people have constructed this Jesus in their own image, and he's uh, standing at the door of your heart asking permission for you and your wisdom to let him in. This kind of thing. And uh, it doesn't fit the model when you really examine him more. But nevertheless, uh, he's saying he speaks in parables so they won't be forgiven. And that's what we have to take it for. So they will not be forgiven. That's what he says. Mm-hmm. When I first but read I, this, I it was think like, yesterday... What? Go ahead. Yeah. I think yesterday you were you were citing that passage as a kind of um, sort of a I think in support of those being elected or predestined and that uh, well, elections is biblical he, people people no true Christian who understands scripture can deny election because election is God's choosing and it says in Ephesians 1 4 he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that's what election is it's right there Right. So if anybody who would deny, right. they're going to deny, you know, the Bible. I mean, okay, so that's there. All right? right. I didn't like it when I first read it, but that's what it says. Right. But I think you said yesterday that he, he was speaking in parables so that those particular people that wouldn't understand would not be saved. They wouldn't have an opportunity to be saved. If they, if they understood, be the they might have an opportunity yeah. to be saved. And so yeah, I, he's hiding, I think I he's hiding upon, things. Right, in parable. Go ahead. Uh-huh. So I think I touched Sorry. upon yesterday briefly that um, that it doesn't seem to logically pan out if God has elected and predestined those to be saved already before the foundations of the earth, then it's already settled. The case is already settled. God already knows who he will save. You know, Good theology. He will yeah. Absolutely good theology, which makes sense why he'd speak in parables to the non-elect, so they won't get saved. Perfectly consistent. That's where, yeah, that's where I would need you to uh, enlighten me, because if it's already settled, there's nothing Jesus could say or do that, oh, that would not that easy. have those people have those people receiving salvation. It's already a settled it's, matter. It's, it's not. Close. It's not that easy. <laughs> It's a great question. We're out of time. Oh, help. Man, help I wish I could get into yeah. that. It has to do with logical priority and uh, temporal priority, election, uh, federal headship. It's logical a great boundary. topic. <laughs> oh, man, it's good stuff. But we're out of time. Call back Monday, okay? okay. We'll see if we can tackle it Monday. Good stuff. All right. Man. Have a good Seriously. weekend. You God too, bless. man. God bless. Hey, folks, we're out of time. That was a great question. Oh, hey. We'll see you Monday. God bless. Another program powered by the Truth Network.